We want to thank the American Boxer Club Charitable Foundation and their H&R Committee for allowing us to come speak with them today about the impact that they have had on canine health. My name is Sheila Nordone. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of the AKC Canine Health Foundation. First thing I'd like to do is give you an overview of the next 15 minutes and what I'll be talking about. I'm going to first start by talking about your financial contribution, talk with you about some of the highlights of the American Boxer Charitable Foundation's contributions to medical progress. And I'm going to, just going to hit the highlights. You, you've made significant contributions to multiple areas, but I do want to highlight some areas of significance, including degenerative myelopathy, cancer, and heart disease. And then finally, I'm going to share, give you an overview of some currently funded studies that we would love for you to consider supporting in the future. First, your impact. The American Boxer Charitable Foundation has given $803,599,000 to 47 different grants that have been funded by the AKC Canine Health Foundation. Your impact in canine health has been broad and significant. You've given generously to musculoskeletal disease, oncology, cardiac disease, and gastrointestinal disease. And the most impressive thing to me as CSO has been your support of basic science. And I think what this really shows is that you have made a long-term commitment to solving some of the greatest health problems that we face in canine health. And it also shows that you have a very deep understanding of research and, medical, and medicine and how we have to invest in basic science in order to make long-term medical progress. The first contribution uh, of significance that you've made is in the area of degenerative myelopathy. As you well know, DM is a progressive fatal adult onset neurodegenerative disease. In 2006, when you first sponsored a grant for degenerative myelopathy, it was grant 821, and the investigator was Dr. Joan Coates at Missouri's College of Veterinary Medicine. At the time, when the grant was funded, she had some preliminary data in Pembroke Welsh Corgi showing that there was likely to be a genetic lesion that was causing DM. Your significant funding of this project resulted in a landmark paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2009 identifying SOD1 as the genetic mutation responsible for DM. And in this landmark paper, Dr. Coates and her colleagues show that there was a guanine to adenine transition, and this missense mutation resulted in SOD1 leading to a protein that was dysfunctional. Now, if we fast forward to 2014, there's been a significant attempt to, to characterize the genetic mutation in 222 breeds. It was published this year. And what they found is that G to A transition is responsible for DM in the vast majority of breeds that have to deal with this disorder. And there is only one breed in which there is a different mutation, and that's in um, a G to thymine or guanine to thymine mutation. So significant contribution not just to your breed but to 222 breeds from the initial funding of that research effort. Sponsorship of that grant also had a significant impact on one medicine. That is research that has application for both dogs and for humans. And so what Dr. Coates did was she started looking at canine DM as a potential model for human amyotrophic lateral scler sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, it's, as it's more commonly known. In humans, this is a progressive neurogenerative disease, and Dr. Coates saw a great deal of similarity in disease progression between canine DM and ALS in humans. In 2012, she received an NIH R21 grant. This is, these are NIH's versions, uh, version of exploratory grants. And the grant that she received was titled Therapeutic Development for ALS in a Canine Model. It was for $223,938. And she recently published a paper entitled Characterization of Thoracic Motor and Sensory Neurons and Spinal Nerve Roots in Canine DM, a Potential Disease Model for ALS. This is a significant finding because she's going to be able to continue to use this one medicine model and bring resources into the veterinary community as well as address a significant problem in human health. So moving on to oncology. 
You've invested very heavily in the work done by Dr. Jaime Modiano at University of Minnesota. And one of his main focuses has been tumor suppressor genes. And I've given you the list of genes, P53, RB, P21. There are several genes that researchers believe are responsible for suppression of tumors. And in the case of cancer, loss of function of these genes ultimately leads to metastasis. This has broad application across areas of oncology, including melanoma, osteosarcoma, and hemangiosarcoma. In 1999, when you sponsored your first grant in this area, we understood very little about the role of these tumor suppressor genes in the pathogenesis of canine disease. And if we fast forward to 2011, what we now have is a documentation of genomic instability in tumor suppressor genes, and also DNA copy number aberrations. So you've been able to provide significant support for the basic science that's really helped us to understand some of the underlying mechanisms that may drive tumor metastasis. You've also contributed generously to Matthew Breen's work, and he has predominantly looked at cytogenetic changes. And these are chromosomal aberrations that may play an important role in the diagnosis, prognosis, and management of human cancers. At the time when you first invested in 2002, we didn't know much about the role of chromosomal aberrations in the dog. So starting with Grant 119, we started to bring molecular cytogenic technology to the dog that wasn't present before. You have to have the techniques in place in order to do the work. And your charitable trust you know, wisely saw that we have to create infrastructure to move forward. So you supported Grant 119. And then from there, Dr. Breen was able to start looking at tumor-associated DNA copy number aberrations. He identified single copy deletions and amplifications. and whole chromosomal aneuploidy differences. So that was in 2002. Fast forward to 2013, we have the first documented treatment response using molecular cytogenetic techniques that you invested in um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, in a domestic dog with spontaneous cancer. And so this was the first publication to so, show cytogenetic remission and what this means is we can start to bring in personalized medicine and understand genetically whether a dog is able to respond, is responding adequately to chemotherapeutics that we've um, applied in the clinic. So investing in basic science ultimately bridged the gap to the veterinary clinic and to treatment for these animals. And then I'm going to finish up oncology with osteosarcoma. In 2007, you funded two grants, you sponsored two grants, 137 and then 1317, to identify mutations and their functional consequences. If we fa and this work was done by Shurston Limblad-Toe at the Broad. If we fast forward to 2013, what Dr. Limblad-Toe's group has identified are genetic lesions that are upstream of a specific gene called CDKN2AB. She's been able to document the functional consequences of altered regulation of the cell cycle um, in dysregulation of this gene. And the important thing, and again, another one medicine focus here, is that this gene is, has syntony with a human locus on a human chromosome, chromosome 9. And what that means is while the gene itself may not be identical, those areas genetically surrounding, or the DNA surrounding that gene, um, are identical to the human. And so there is strong one, in me one medicine potential to use canine osteosarcoma now as a model for understanding and developing new therapeutics to treat disease in humans. Importantly for the dog, we now understand that there are these genetic lesions present, and ultimately Dr. Limblad Toe's goal is to move this towards a genetic test for different breeds. This has also given us an enhanced understanding of the molecular signaling responsible for angiogenesis in osteosarcoma because she started to understand how dysregulation is impacting the cell cycle and ultimately tumor progression and that metastasis. The final component of oncology that I'm going to talk with you about is mast cell tumors. In 2005, we lacked basic understanding of canine mast cells in general and you generously funded grants 179 and 678. This was Cheryl London's work where she first started out by characterizing canine mast cell function. 
and she created a mast cell tumor line called CL1 that was made broadly available to the community, so you contributed to research infrastructure broadly. And Dr. London and her group were able to establish that mitotic index, or cellular proliferation, was indeed a good prognostic tool for mast cell tumors in the dog. In 2007, we did not have many targeted therapeutics that we could use for mast cell tumors in the dog. So you generously funded Grant 975, and this is Cheryl London's work again, where she looked at modulation of mast cell-derived prostaglandins and leukotrienes as a means to impair mast cell function. So it was a means to a targeted therapeutic that would impair mast cell tumors. And through this work, she found that there was an NSAID available that she identified to be the most effective in treating mast cell tumors. I'm going to switch gears now to cardiology and talk about the early understanding in 1997 to 2000 that there was likely a familial pattern of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, but so the occurrence appeared to be associated with pedigree, but the genomics, the genetic underpinning of this disease was undefined at this point. And this is all Kate Muir's work that you've generously supported. We, at the time, we also didn't really understand much about the clinical outcomes once ventricular arrhythmias were diagnosed. So fast forward to 2010, because of your generous support of Dr. Muir's work, she was able to discover a, a mutation in a gene encoding a protein called striatin. And while this particular mutation is associated with disease, it was also realized pretty early that it is not fully penetrant, meaning that we can have animals that are heterozygous for the mutation that actually don't display symptoms of disease. And we can have animals that are homozygous for the mutation that don't show symptoms of disease meaning that there may be other genetic factors involved that actually are related to disease occurrence. So in 2013, Dr. Muir's was funded to search for genetic modifiers so that she can fully understand all the genetics that contribute to cardiomyopathy in the boxer. Now I want to move into where we start discussing the current state of the science based on the historical giving and the historical funding by the ABCF where we are today. But in order to start that conversation, I need to tell you a little bit about how we've restructured scientific program. Now I'd like to talk with you a little bit about what we have currently funded and how the ABCF can continue its incredible support of canine health research. And in order to do that, I have to give you a little bit of background on how we've restructured scientific program to better fit with a model of really creating depth and building on our, our previous successes. As you well know, based on your funding history, you, you clearly understand that each study does not work in isolation, but really acts as a building block to move us forward. And so what we've done is started to conceptualize the science we fund as a portfolio. And within this larger portfolio, we create a natural division of the science to build capacity in the science and create depth in research funding. We've done this by writing requests for proposals that define specific research program areas. And this allows donors to build capacity in areas of importance to them. So this allows you to give to a specific area rather than a specific grant, and this gives us depth in that area. It really starts to become directive of what we fund. So just to give you a cartoon of, of what we've done, we have our larger portfolio, as you just can see, is imaged by the, the big green oval. And then within there, we have specific research program areas, such as dermatology, immunology, cardiology, oncology. And they are buckets that allow us to build capacity in funding research within those areas of importance to our donors. So now I'm going to talk with you specifically about some research program areas that clearly have been important to your breed for the, for the last decade. The first one I'm going to talk about is cardiology. In this new concept where all of these studies are working together, we are addressing some of the most critical canine cardiac diseases such as mitral valve disease, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, pulmonary hypertension from various angles. We're looking at improved therapeutics. Um, improved use of existing drugs is one of the 
studies that we have currently have funded. Um, early and accurate diagnosis, we funded quite a bit of biomarker work and, and higher level imaging studies so that we can diagnose disease earlier, giving us an opportunity to intervene earlier. We've also in, invested heavily in cutting edge new therapeutics such as gene therapy. Um, this is something we're able to do in the dog, uniquely in the dog, um, that ultimately may have one medicine potential. But as you can see, in coming at these various um, cardiac diseases from multiple angles, ultimately our goal is to identify genetic markers of disease directly through GWAS and indirectly through enhanced understanding of the mechanism of disease. In oncology, we focused, um, we started focusing pretty heavily on personalized medicine. And so some of this work was funded through the large collaborative grants that we did with the Golden Retrievers last year, where we're starting to look at heritable risk factors, genetic and epigenetic changes. And um, again, we're trying to work and fund our portfolio at the level of the state of the science. What we understand now is that there are heritable um, traits that are not directly related to the DNA sequence, but rather upstream of that. Um, a DNA methylation and chromatin re remodeling known as epi the epigenome or epigenetics. And we also know that we need to start looking downstream of DNA, looking at the, the RNA to protein part of the pathway that ultimately gives us our disease phenotype. So we started to fund work in areas of the transcriptome, the proteome, and the phosphoproteome. Ultimately, all of this works together to give us our disease phenotype. And then we've also started focusing heavily on funding cancer stem cell research. We know that cancer stem cells are very hard to deal with therapeutically, and we need to understand their basic biology a little bit better, ultimately, if we're going to understand disease progression and identify therapeutics that can really cure cancer. And again, we're continuing our research funding in the area of cytogenetics with Mark Matthew Breen. We've also invested heavily last year in gastrointestinal disease um, in our gastrointestinal disease program area. We funded Grant 2002, Defining the Genetic Basis of Inflammatory Bowel Disease, Dr. Karen Allen-Spash at the RBC. This has direct application to the boxer, as well as Grant 2050, Defining the Genetic Susceptibility of Granulomatous Colitis, a very severe form of inflammatory bowel disease that is seen in the boxer. This, this award went to Kenny Simpson at Cornell University. We funded a grant in our ophthalmology program area, Grant 2057, Identification of the Genetic Cause of Corneal Ulcers, known as Boxer Ulcers. This award went to Keith Montgomery at North Carolina State University. And so now what I'd like to do is talk to you about continuing the partnership between the ABCF and the Canine Health Foundation. At the current time, the donor advised fund balance for the ABCF is $322,047.72. What we're requesting in support from the ABCF for 2014 is a very significant donation to allow us to move forward to fund the research we have in our portfolio that has direct application to the boxer and start to create depth in the areas that are clearly important to um, to the ABCF. So we're requesting $150,000 in sponsorship of our cardiology research program area to continue Kate Muir's striatin work and uh, to support some of our cardiology biomarker work that we've invested in. We're requesting $50,000 sponsorship of oncology research. Um, this is to support the cytogenetic research that you've invested in previously as well as the work that's being done by Jaime Modiano, Tristan Limbad Plato, and Matthew Breen in the areas of uh, identifying those, those genetic lesions associated with development of disease. We're requesting $27,000 in sponsorship of ophthalmology, and that's to cover the Boxer Ulcer Grant um, that we funded for Keith Montgomery last year in 2013. And then 75000 for the gastrointestinal disease research program area. And this is to support the two IBD grants, the, the IBD and the granulomatous colitis grant that have direct application to the boxer. So collectively, we're requesting $302,000 in total research sponsorship from the boxer donor advised fund. The 2014 request for support from the ABCF 
Um, again, we've talked about the research sponsorships to date being $803,599. Today's request would move the ABCF total research sponsorships past the $1 million mark. And this is highly significant for this foundation. ABCF would be the second largest all-time sponsor of research, and this would put the ABCF less than $100,000 from the top spot. Why is CHF asking for this unprecedented donor advised fund transfer? Well, first, um, active CHF research includes several boxer-specific projects, and these breed-specific research projects must get the support of the breed clubs of the breed's parent club. It, because it's more difficult to leverage sponsorships from other breeds when grants are boxer specific. And so for a good example would be Keith Montgomery's boxer ulcer grant, the corneal ulcer grant, were highly unlikely to get any other sponsorship outside of the boxer foundation. We also need to refill the buckets or build capacity in program areas, and this will open the door for renewed emphasis on cardiology, oncology, and gastrointestinal disease. We haven't been able to include these areas in this fiscal year, 2014, and new requests for proposals because we don't have the funding capacity right now in those program areas. Another reason for this unprecedented donor advised fund transfer is leadership. We believe that the ABCF will act as an example to other clubs that also have high donor advised fund balances. Right now, 10 of the largest donor advised funds contain over $1.3 million. So a DAF sponsorship of $302,000 by the ABCF will be able to, will be used by our foundation to motivate and leverage other clubs. This unpre unprecedented donor advised fund transfer um, will then hopefully lead to a similar um, response from other clubs, particularly those that are in the top 10, and this would substantially increase this foundation, CHF's ability to approve new research by building capacity in those program areas. In general, this unprecedented donor advised fund transfer is going to foster a new way of thinking about donor advised funds. It's going to place more value on funds being allocated to research than on funds that accumulate in donor advised funds. Moving forward, new donations to donor advised funds will be accompanied with instructions on what program areas to support based on the responses that the clubs have given us in our health poll surveys and what, we've, what we see from historical giving. And our goal ultimately is to keep donor advised fund balances low because we've moved money into active research programs. This is also going to give the ABCF an opportunity for recognition. In passing the $1 million mark for sponsorship, um, this will be the single largest donor advised fund transfer in CHF history and will obviously be recognized in newsletters, press releases, event recognition, and on banners. So I want to finish by thanking you for your longstanding, tremendous support of CHF. I want to thank you for support of basic science um, in general. I think it's incredible that you recognize that you are in this for the long haul that there are no easy fixes to our biggest problems, and that you have decided to be truly a distinguished research partner with CHF rather than just a donor. So we thank you for all of your support. What we've provided to you is an overview of our entire grant portfolio, as well as a document showing the impact that you've had on canine health over the last decade. And we've done this through citing all of the papers that are related to, directly associated with the grants you've sponsored. And we've also provided you with an abbreviated list of grants that we think would be most interesting to boxers. But again, the, the whole portfolio is available for you to consider as well. Thank you again, and we'd be happy to answer any questions either through an over-the-phone conference call or just one-on-one. -on -one.